Before the Rings of Power, there were the Silmarils. Before Sauron, there was his master Morgoth. Before Aragorn and Arwen, there was Beren and Luthien. Join us as we explore Tolkien and all the ages of Middle-earth with your hosts from TheOneRing.com, Jonathan Watson, Michael Grumbine, and Dan Coates. You know, when we started this podcast, I thought that, um, that, you know, it would take us a year -ish or, or so to get the Silmarillion, but if you get through the Silmarillion, but if you asked me how long it would take us to get through on fairy stories, and I would say like nine hours of talking, <laughs> Michael, keep counting. It's higher than three. Mm -hmm. We're up, we're up to number six now, episode six, as we go through on fairy stories. I mean, we couldn't even last week, we couldn't even cut it up into the, uh, the sections that Tolkien cut it up into in his own work. We, had to we like, are wordier than Tolkien. Hmm. But let, let me hijack this podcast for one brief second. And instead of staring at my co-host on the screen, let me break the fourth wall. Dear listeners, this will be our shortest podcast ever. I guarantee it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to cut out at like 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, all of a sudden, Michael's internet fails, <laughs> fails, fails. Yeah. We are on to, uh, we, well, to go with the, uh, the the name of this episode, we're we're here to console you as we close on fairy stories because we're going to talk about consolation. The last part of on fairy stories is called uh, recovery, escape, consolation. And last week we went through recovery and escape, how um, recovery, like recovery of sight, recovery of of the wonder of the world in a way. Um, a recovery of the freshness of vision. Freshness. That's the word he uses. That's right. Freshness of vision um, and escape. Escape from a lot of things. I think he goes, he gives a lot of examples. And I don't think he ever, like we talked about it last week, never really defines escape so succinctly as he defines recovery. We're escaping from the bounds of the world, so to speak, the things that limit us. And you could even put it in a positive way instead of escaping from something, although you can put it that way. We, um, he uses the phrase in the very first sentence, actually, of what we're going to talk about with consolation. He talks about it as the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires. So, mm. so when you're escaping, so you're satisfying the desire. What kind of desire do you satisfy? The desire for unbounded movement, flight or underwater you're satisfied the desire That's for the right. speaking this the, the desire to speak with animals as adam had in the garden and we've lost you're satisfying the desire to be free of death um which see is, again you're giving us examples just like tolkien without defining it mm -hmm. uh those are the so the desires the the, the right, definition know, is the freedom of um to basically fulfill those ancient desires desires and, and okay be free of the to, to get away Mass-produced electric streetlights. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Escape right. cars. Mass-produced electric streetlights, which is essentially what we have right here in front of us all I, the time I, as I hold look, up my phone. After our last episode, I am now somewhat convinced that C.S. Lewis was in fact trolling Tolkien because C.S. Lewis would <laughs> have had light. to have known this essay. He would have he would have heard it and read it from because Tolkien published it before C.S. Lewis began work, and he has that whole section about. How terrible the electric! I mean, that's what the street light was in England at that time. It was those lanterns out on the yeah, street, right? And and so so the fact that C.S. Lewis has those lantern that lantern grow and right in there his, in his sub created world is pr almost definitely like a three student. So yeah. what he was really trying to say from <laughs> to Tolkien is like there is no escape. That's right. You're stuck the, here the forever. Street, the street it's like it's like what about bob the street lamps will follow you you don't understand <laughs> <laughs> all right so there's recovery and escape we're on to consolation and guys um this might like i don't know michael the shortest one ever i don't know but hey if it, it is be. short you'll be able to get an even longer one if you become a member at the one com slash member and get our extended pod pass podcast four dollars a month first month's free can you believe it guys even during these these times of economic trial and bidenomics and and amazing horrible disasters in southern california like a hurricane coming in washing everything away and blowing every not well, never mind and uh dan 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 yeah, lives in southern I, california I, and we, there was no... I, I i am a survivor <laughs> i i made it through that's right. Um, Did you mark yourself yeah. as, as okay in Facebook and do that whole thing too? <laughs> mark myself as safe. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, nothing happened. But it, it, it is funny how like how people came out of the woodwork and were like, are you guys okay? Are you guys okay? Yeah, it, it, it rained for a few hours. That was kind of it. <laughs> that was it. 
Yeah. They still get we can predict the climate, but you can't predict the weather ten hours from now. That's pretty much oh, where man. we are. Anyway. Anyway, so if you so wanna scary. if you wanna hear these um uh uh alleyway conversations that don't have anything to do with the major thoroughfare we're actually talking about. Uh, right. You can get to our extended podcast <laughs> uh, by going to the one slash member, become a member and uh, get part of our, uh, get, get access to our discord chat uh, where you can ask us questions. And we've got a really interesting question this week from Harrison. He's asking about, so since we talked about fantasy and we talked about how uh, a, a, the, 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 the the artifact of Middle Earth, like the creation of Middle Earth in a physical form, meaning like a uh, um, uh, painting or a movie or TV show, uh, like it affects our vision of Middle Earth. It affects that true crea- creator to uh, what do we call the sub-creative uh, part of Middle Earth, where it's just you 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 imbue it within your head, right? You, you experience it completely as your own sub-creation. Uh, should we even buy books or look at pictures by? artists like Nasmith and Howe and Lee and all the other ones that are out there. I mean, most of the art that's done now is essentially riffing off of uh, Peter Jackson anyway. Um, so it doesn't really matter, but that, that earlier stuff, there's, you know, s- some of it I wouldn't recommend looking at like the Hildebrand brothers things. Those were kind of off the deep end, but we're going to talk about that. some. this podcast has three parts, people, three parts. It has the first part, very short that talks about the comparison between what consolation is to uh, to fairy stories versus what and making them the highest kind of, uh, of of literary art versus what consolation is for drama which if you remember from the last time is not literary art in, in Tolkien's mind drama is presentational art it's visual art um, in front of you so so um, he can contrast those two very briefly then the second and largest part of this podcast is about Tolkien's new word that he invents in this very essay, much, much used in today by today's Tolkien fanatics called eucatastrophe. It is, in fact, a kind of opposite of what we would call a catastrophe. Um, and we'll go into that. And then the last part is his um, digression in, in the epilogue into that truth and joy, which fairy stories can give us a gleam and glimpse into which he believes in the real world is born out. And this is where he leans very heavily into his, his Christian roots, um, born out in a different way under a different and greater story, um, which encompasses, it's the greatest fairy story and a whole bunch of other kinds of stories all at once, which is the gospel. And so anyway, that's, those are the three parts. So to the first part, fairy stories, what makes consolation different? It's not enough, says Tolkien, to just have the escape from all the limitations that we have. In other words, that escape into, as we mentioned earlier, the imaginative satisfaction of ancient desires. So the imaginative um, escape from death, the imaginative escape from the bounds of walkings, the imaginative escape from the limitations and mute um, communication between us and animals and a whole bunch of other limitations. Not enough. Consolation is something more. And it is, he says, quote, far more important is the consolation of the happy ending. Almost I would venture to assert that all complete fairy stories must have it. Okay, so what is the highest function? It is um, the of the fairy story. He says, since we do not appear to possess a word that expresses this opposite, I will call it eucatastrophe. And I'm sorry, I, I missed the opposite. So the opposite is, is what the um, Tolkien says, at least I would say that tragedy is the true form of drama, its highest function. But the opposite of true is true of fairy, of fairy story. Mm-hmm. So we have the juxtaposition between tragedy as the highest form of drama and fairy story as the highest form of the literary tale. Sorry I talked so much. That's the first part. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that he says tragedy is the highest form of drama and that, and he puts it on an opposite. There's a spectrum. He says on the opposite end of that is fairy story, and he comes up with you catastrophe. The opposite isn't just telling a story where nothing but happy things happen. It's got to be. It's got to have a turn. It's got to have things are going bad, and then there's a sudden turn. Um, I, I thought that that was a really interesting perspective. Yes, yes, and that's why it is. It'd be true to say that it is not enough that you just have 
the happy ending for for a fairy story like the all we and they all lived happily ever after that's not enough that's that's not right. the ending of the true fairy story in fact if you we recall tolkien's greatest fairy story which is the lord of the rings you will notice that it is not that all live happily ever after some live happily ever after mm -hmm. but many do not frodo does not due to his wound bilbo does not because of the mark um they they do go to the happiest place in arda but the implication is that there's this wound that doesn't heal. They are there's a sadness in them that doesn't go away. The elves, although they have triumphed with the, the men and the hobbits and the dwarves, they've triumphed against Sauron. They're they're not happily ever after. In their triumph, their world has been their magic has been the enchantment that they have over the earth has been broken and they begin to fade and so they have to leave as well. So yeah. there's a sadness. Um, uh, and that Tolkien bakes in, so it's not happily ever after. So but it is. It, let me let me ask a question. Huge catastrophe. So um, does by saying the the constellation of fairy stories, the joy of the happy ending. Mm -hmm. To me, that doesn't that doesn't imply happily ever after necessarily. Right. It means a you there. The ending has a, as he says, it has the the joyous turn. Um. So it's yeah, not. Think... Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I was going to say it's not necessarily happily ever after for everybody, but I think he does write in this essay where he talks about it, how you catastrophe doesn't um, deny that there's bad things that happen and there's there, what does he call them? Just regular catastrophes or discatastrophe, mm -hmm. but it, it denies despite all the evidence that your eyes see the, the universal final defeat That's that it, it's, it's going to be at the end, everything will be, tossed over and we'll all be lost so i think he's saying you catastrophe tells a story where there's a sudden turn that gives you a glimpse that you know in the end evil doesn't fully and finally win that's exactly right that's exactly right so we could talk a bit more about this you catastrophe he says he he puts it a bunch of different ways in a, in a couple of paragraphs um i like the one where he says it is a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur so this is this joyous mm. turn. Now, the moment of you catastrophe in the Lord of the Rings, what would you guys say it is? Huh. What's the sudden and joyous turn when all seems lost? And then there's the joyous turn and and the, the, can, uh, the salvation of can, Middle Earth anyway. Are we saying there can be only one? Oh, no. I mean, but I think there's one primary one in the Lord of the Rings. Um but what I'm interested to hear what you guys think. I, <laughs> it's so funny because the word joyous messes me up because I really want to say it's where the ring is destroyed, right? That's the turn that no one, like the way it happened is the turn that no one was expecting. But is it joyous? I guess. So the, so, so, so here's the, yes. Um, yes, it is. But that's, but it's interesting because it is that the mo that moment. I agree with you. It is that that moment is the moment of you catastrophe. But the the actual narrative, you catastrophe, takes place not at Mount Doom, but in front of the Black Gate. So so when is it? Um, for the last narrative that we have, it's when Pippin is thinks he's dying, and then he hears that the eagles are coming. So the eagles actually are the servants of manway so what mm -hmm. i think is that just like in the hobbit the the turn is when the eagles arrive and the battle is the big battle begins to turn at least for a moment and then the eucatastrophe completes it's not a single pinprick of mo moment it's a start it starts with the eagles coming and then it ends with the sudden and almost almost unbelievably sudden and dramatic loss where the evil where Sauron himself goes down his tower of Beridur impregnable tower collapses the black gate um and all of the armies are, mm -hmm. are scattered in an instant because of the of the death of Sauron or at least the the, the banishment of his spirit from the earth and so this, this that's the moment that's the catastrophe, and it was all everything was hopeless right up to that point the the um the armies of gondor are were going to be destroyed all of our the remaining companions pippin legolas gimli aragorn gandalf were all going to be killed um 
Frodo and Sam were on the, uh, they were going to die themselves and Gollum had just bitten the ring off of Frodo. So the ring, now, now the ring isn't going in. Um, there's that moment where it's all lost. Everything's lost. And, and it start the, the, the moment of loss starts with Frodo putting on the ring and, and failing in his, in his um, mission. So his mission was to destroy the ring and he fails yeah. by putting it on and claiming it for his own. So, so anyway, that's what I think the Eucatastrophe starts from the Eagles yeah. and ends with the destruction of the ring with Gollum falling, shrieking, and then the so, collapse of the Tower of Beridor. In So I think we need to, uh, part, part of this is how it's written in the book versus how it's presented in the films too, because we're so aware of how it's presented in the films. Hmm. Uh, because in the book, it happens, I just looked it up in book five, chapter 10, at the very end, it's one of the, it's the, one of the last things um, that, uh, right, that, that, that's, that said is the eagles are coming, the eagles are coming, and then we get the entire story of Frodo, whereas if I'm not mistaken, don't the eagles come after the ring's already been destroyed in the films? I don't believe so. Do they say the eagles are coming before? Here's why. As I soon as Frodo him. claims the ring, the Nazgul immediately turn from the battle and, and rush like faster than the wind, I believe is the is the phrase, towards Mount Doom. So, right. but before that, they were fighting the Eagles. So the Eagles come to save the people, the the you know, do what they can in the battle. And there's a period in which the Eagles are fighting against the Nazgul and against the other, and and the Nazgul haven't turned. There's 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 things happening. And then as soon as Frodo claims the ring, boom, it's mine, puts it on. Then the, the Nazgul, the Lord, Dark Lord, senses his, claiming, his claim, right. and immediately the, the Nazgul turn and begin flying towards Mount Doom. And then you have what amounts to probably, who knows, 15 seconds where Frodo has it on. He's wrestling with, um, um, you know, Gollum jumps on him, he's wrestling, Gollum bites it off, 15, 20 seconds maybe. And then Gollum has the ring and dances around. So maybe a total of 30 seconds, um, definitely less than a minute, where between the, the Nazgul turning and flying and the um, and then Gollum falling, shrieking. And as soon as Gollum falls, falls shrieking into, the, into Mount Doom, and then that starts the almost instantaneous cascade of the collapse of the Tower of Baradur and the defeat of, of Sauron in an instant. Sauron... Yeah. It takes in every other time in Middle Earth, it takes so long for Sauron to be defeated, and you think he's defeated, and he isn't. The whole history of the Middle Earth, like the the siege of, it, it, for those that have read the histories of the Second Age, the siege, the last alliance of Elzamin, and and the siege of um, the uh, of the of Mordor, and the it was was years and years long, and then the final battle between Gilgalad and and Elendil. Um, El, um, Elrond and uh, Isildur versus Sauron was um, it's just a huge time frame and then and then but in this story everything's compressed into like a minute or two so mm -hmm. so where the Sauron goes from about to win everything to Losing utterly everything. utterly destroyed <clears throat> so is go ahead. catastrophe so is you catastrophe I'm trying to nail it down to how fine of a moment is it, right? Oh, is it's it... a it's a narrative moment, so it could be as long as you want, mm -hmm. but it has to. There has to be a suddenness to it somehow. There has to be an unexpected yeah. nature to it somehow. It doesn't have to be like a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I think it could last a decent amount of time, but it has to be this sudden turn from the narrative perspective. The turn mm -hmm. has to be sudden and unexpected. It has to be what does I say? Sudden and miraculous. That's what mm -hmm. Tolkien says. Mm -hmm. So not only does it have to be relatively swift, but it has to have be unlooked for. It has to be miraculous. It has to come from a from a place which nobody saw out from left field. Hmm. Let me read this part. Um, this is the only time in the letters of J.R. Tolkien that that um, Tolkien mentions you catastrophe. Uh, and this is in a letter in 1944 that he was writing to his son, who I believe was uh, fighting in Northern Africa at the time, World War hmm. II. Um, and he says, in the essay I wrote, uh, I coined the word, you catastrophe, the sudden happy turn in a story which pierces you with a joy that brings tears, which I argued is the highest function of fairy stories to produce. And I was there led to the view that it produces its peculiar effect because it is a sudden glimpse of truth with a capital T, truth. 
Mm -hmm. Your whole nature chained in material cause and effect. The chain of death feels a sudden relief as if a major limb out of joint had suddenly snapped back. I like that. Your whole nature chained in material cause and effect. The chain of death feels a sudden relief as if, if a major limb out of joint had suddenly snapped back. Yeah, that, that gives the, the visceral. That, that gives the visceral nature of it and also the close connection between tears yeah. and, and, and um, joy. Because he calls it, a, in this essay, I mean, obviously, I think this, uh, that letter you wrote, which is an awesome, perfect letter, five years after this was, the set, this was revised. Um, in his in his final form, so so um, he's obviously referencing this because he has, uses almost the same language, but the language he uses he says it gives a fleeting gl glimpse of joy, capital J. Mm -hmm. Now co let's combine that with what you just said, Jonathan. I would just like to point out to our listeners that this is a combination from philosophy. So the 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 whole point of the seeking after truth, which is what philosophy is, is to seek the good, the true, the beautiful. So and but but the the magic in philosophy is that those three things, the good, the true and the beautiful are actually all the same thing. They are reality under different aspects. So true, the true that you just read, Jonathan, mm -hmm. is reality understood by the mind. The good is re, is reality in its purest form desired by an intellect, by somebody, an agent. And the beautiful is reality viewed as good in itself just it's it's ju like it's just um showing forth its its um desirability um and so there is there is a uh th this this is what i think joy is the, with a capital j so he's here talking about in the two letters um well the one letter in this essay the same thing it's the glimpse of joy capital j in this one and it's the what what was the word he used in that one it's the something of truth jonathan uh the sudden glimpse of truth oh he says use glimpse as well so glimpse of truth so he's talking about the same thing there um and uh when that turn comes and, and i like he here's our description in this essay about what happens when you you, re, you read you catastrophe a you catastrophic event he says it is the mark of a good fairy story of the higher and more complete kind that however wild its events, however fantastic or terrible the adventures, it can give to the child or a man that hears it when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beating and lifting of the heart near to tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality. So, so this is what the best fairy stories do. Yeah, you can see why Tolkien is so insistent that fairy stories are not just for children and they must be serious. Because if they're not serious and the stakes are not high, you can't have a moment where this sudden turn takes you from catastrophe to joy. Like you have to have some mm -hmm. serious narrative to, to make that meaningful. Yep. Yep. And that serious narrative can't even be a normal thing. I would argue, interestingly enough, that it needs the eagles. It needs in, in you need some element to make it a real fairy story. The there needs to be the supernatural, the miraculous. There needs to be some element above. It can't just be. Um, you know, there are many you catastrophic, lesser you catastrophic moments in Tolkien's work. So, for example, the ride of the Rohirrim saving. Minas Tirith is a you catastrophic moment when they appear on the um, on the hill and then charge down to the the appearance of Aragorn and the the men of this of Southern Gondor on the ships of the Corsairs and and the ship the fact that it's the ships of the Corsairs and you think that it's actually Sauron's reinforcements arriving and then it turns out to be Aragorn and the men that's you catastrophic um, there's many you catastrophic moments but the final one the most powerful one has this element of the eagles, which I think is necessary for the mo for a fairy story to be a fairy story, not just a mm -hmm. not just a um, knight's tale of some kind. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, yeah. Jonathan. You're uh, if, you're, uh, you're making faces. If I were to play um, devil's, devil's advocate, advocate. Yep, yeah, yeah, people would say that's not you catastrophe. That's Deus ex machina. That's that's just the author coming in and saying, yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my hand in here and uh, solve the problem that was incredibly difficult for me to solve. That, I think that's what we'd hear from other people who are reading this. who are like, I don't know about that. Hmm. Okay, so good. that's a good challenge. Where it fails and where the, neither the Rohirrim nor Aragorn um, on the ships, the Corsairs, nor the Eagles coming are deus ex machina, 
is that the deus ex machina comes from the need for an author to write himself out of a bind that he's in right in, through a cheap literary trick or a quick fix mm -hmm. so it, it might have the shallow appearance of similarity with eucatastrophe in that sort of swiftness of eucatastrophe which takes place there's a turn in an instant but if you look at the way tolkien uses eucatastrophe he has built the 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 eucatastrophic solution in every case he's there's been tremendous he's earned the ride of the Rohirrim through their long marches across Rohan trying to get mm -hmm. to Minas Tirith he you've he's earned Aragorn and the men of the southern Gondor um, coming out of the ships with the paths of the dead and all of the terrible the terrible journey even the eagles coming is earned because if you remember and Tolkien sets the example back in the Hobbit when all peoples throw everything they have against an on an evil which looks overwhelming and which is starting to win, then it's there's no Deus ex machina. Then the stewards of the earth, namely the Valar, step in to aid them. That's not a Deus ex machina. That's not an invented twist. It's just Tolkien. That's that's the rules. That's the way yeah. Tolkien built his world. So there, it's not a Deus ex. I I, I agree with you. Although I think um, people who don't know and who don't do don't know the world Tolkien created can read it more easily. As yes, Deus Ex agreed, Machina. agreed. Yeah, that's true. I would, that's I would also throw in there appreciate. too. Uh, I would also throw in there that uh, he even writes that this U catastrophe, this idea of a sudden turn, where maybe someone would read it on a shallow level and say, "Oh, it's just you just made up a bind and then wrote yourself out of it." He does say like it reflects a glory backwards. So for, for Tolkien, his idea is that the actions of all these characters are meaningful in, in the event that there is Eru behind it all. And he's woven this whole story that we've already had, like in reading the Cimmerillion, we had the song of the Ainur and everything's been sung. Everything that'll happen is going to come to, come to uh, take place. And I think for, for Tolkien, this idea of the, the sovereignty of God, the the um, pre, uh, predestination, if you want us to put it that way, but just the idea that these things that are taking place in the narrative, um, it reflects a glory backwards because it's reflecting a plan of the creator who who wove it all into being and, and started this process. So I, I think that that also is a part of this too, that it's not just oh, I'm going to make this impossible situation, and oh, here's the solution. I, I think he's he's writing this impossible situation so that he can show how the, the from the very beginning it was leading to this moment. Yeah. Oh, Michael, you are muted. Michael. Yeah, the slow build is that is indeed necessary, and Tolkien does the slowest of builds for those that have read the Silmarillion. Um, there is in Manwe... A desire to protect. He is he is the high king of the earth, given given the charge of protecting. The only reason that Gandalf is there in the first place is because he was sent by the Valar, um, by Manwe, and 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 then Manwe. The eagles are Manwe's um, left hand that he's that, that, that he's always using to yeah. l to learn and to inter in, in, intervene when necessary in Middle Earth. So this is not a Deus Ex. This is a long and slow earn by by tolkien but i agree jonathan you're right that some people will miss it in that regard um i don't actually think tolkien would be too worried with people who are like that's deus ex machina um he would just sort of pat him on the head and say you know read a little bit read a little bit more <laughs> and, and you'll and you'll learn the distinction between a real deus ex and a sudden turn which is which is earned uh so so why didn't uh, the eagles just bring frodo and sam straight to mount doom <laughs> i was hoping you weren't gonna say that <laughs> and my hope was dashed oh You're man talk about that now that's that's beat over just i mean you, you know what's funny about that i have a new answer for that as of this moment that i never had up to this point um why didn't the eagles do that because they didn't need to because the the path that there was that that was laid out that that Ilubitar guided along the way that they helped with was the one that that occurred and there was there was going to be a u catastrophe and so it was and and it only comes through suffering um mm -hmm. so which is one of the other the other lessons um 
that Tolkien always wants to point out with regard to the sadness of the earth. Uh, there's great beauty and there's great sadness on the earth and uh, you got to have the great sadness as well. So no, you, anyway. can't have, you can't have the sudden joyous turn unless there is a, right. Uh, a, a sadness that is building or, or that, that that's descending on you. Right. No right. If it all ends up Not looking a like a video game or it's like some 12 year old, like click Eagles, click Mount Doom, fly. Yeah. And, um, there's nothing earned there. Um, it's, <laughs> Click Sorry, Eagles, click Mount Doom, fly. This is a, it's a point, in, or it's a text adventure from 1980. Return to Zork. I mean, return That's to right. order. You can tell my age. I'm showing my age on it, but um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. what's nope, you first, Dan. Oh man, I, I was just gonna move us forward a little bit, but you can do that. Okay, well, no, I was going to ask, um, to tie up you catastrophe, um, why. Because we go into fairy story, right? And fairy story, Tolkien believes, is uniquely suited to um, to convey consolation and you catastrophe, right? And and escape, right? It's uniquely suited. So why why is it uniquely suited from all other stories to convey you catastrophe? Uh, and as a follow up question, can Non fantasy stories also convey the sudden joyous turn in with with the same effect. I'll answer the second one first. I think Tolkien would say yes, they can use you catastrophe in a non fairy stories, and the reason I say he he would say they can is because the 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 sentence that I read before, which says when the turn comes, blah blah blah, as keen as given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality. So in other words, he's saying fairy stories can can have that turn as keen as any by as, as that given by any form of literary art, which means he's implying other forms of literary art can also use that term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in fairy stories, it, it has a peculiar quality. I don't know. He doesn't say what he means by peculiar, but I think it's a peculiarly poignant quality because, and here's my guess. My guess is fairy stories, what makes them different from other literature, even fiction of, of, of you know, sort of the um, generic, medieval type or ancient fiction mm -hmm. um, is that they have that element of wonder in the other. They have that world, that other world that they reference, which is the middle world. If we take ourselves back to the beginning of his essay, the middle world between the real world and the angelic world between, between the true divine and there's a and the, and the mundane, there's a middle road, which is the fairy, the road to fairy which has a magic about it, but it isn't wholly divorced from our physical world. Um, it has rules just yeah. like our physical world has. Um, and it, it has there its own rules. So fairy stories, I think are kind of middle ground. And so they can lead the mind to, yeah. to a place which is beyond this earth without, mm -hmm. without um, smashing it headlong into the realm of the supernatural and theology. Um, so yeah. I, I, that's what, that's my opinion. Yeah. I think for us to have consolation, we're not going to find it in, um, science fiction. We're not going to find it in things that are, uh, secular or scientific. We're not going to find it in the material world. Right. I think cause we are, we are spiritual beings and we are, we live in a physical world, but for us to be consoled or comforted, I think we have to even look outside this world to receive um, that help and that comfort that we need. And I, yeah. I think you're right that, that fairy tales are kind of like this, this looking into this other realm, this other world where there, where, where magic is real, that, that magical things do happen. And it's, it's kind of like a halfway into that, into the true other world, the true spiritual realm. And on a quick side note, from what you just said, I've been thinking a lot since we've read this essay about science fiction and I would, I would say that there is actually a genre or, or certain instances, I'll call that, certain instances of science fiction which actually would move into the realm of the fairy story. But they're the ones that, to use your language, Dan, which I think you're spot on about, they're the ones in which you're not, the science fiction doesn't revolve around the in, increased or aggregation of further and further technologies. But it, but when there are some kinds of science fiction where when you go visit another world, when people go travel to another world, there's a spiritual thing happening, a mystical thing, a kind of magic that happens there that that 
speaks to the need, the human need to talk about the spiritual and the deep and the thing that is beyond the physical. Um, and if, it, if, so that, if it's that kind of science fiction, which is almost has magic in it, um, then it can approach a fairy story, I think. I've read some some science fiction that's that's a little like that. Yeah, like Paralandra or uh, yeah, Paralandra is the easy one because Lewis. it's it's yeah. it's written by Lewis and and Lewis no doubt has that same you know or at least he was infected <laughs> in a good way by Tolkien yeah. in in a, but I'm thinking of other stuff as well where there's where what's encountered is the mysterious where it isn't like you mm -hmm. go to another planet and they have just different technology from you but there's something completely other happening on a different plane and different spiritual realm um, and a, or sometimes a kind of magical realm. So anyway, there's some science fiction that I think could be, could make it to fairy story, but, but not much. Yeah. I was um, peculiar is the word he uses. Actually. I just looked it up six times in this essay. Ooh, nice. Um, so he says, in the, in, he says, uh, fairy stories off, also offer in a peculiar degree or mode, fantasy recovery, escape consolation. He said that um, uh, it's a mark of good fairy story and the blah, 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 right? As uh, you, you said, right, it's as keen um, as any, okay, so uh, it can give a, a, to a child or man that hears it when the turn comes a catch of the breath, a beat, and lifting of the heart near to tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality, right? And then he says, uh, let me get to it right here. Um, Probably every writer making a secondary world of fantasy, every sub-creator wishes in some measure to be a real maker or hopes that he is drawing on reality, hopes that the peculiar quality of the secondary world are derived from reality or flowing into it. Hmm. And then he writes, um, uh, the peculiar quality of the joy in successful fantasy can thus be explained as a sudden glimpse of the underlying reality or truth. And then he writes, uh, they, being um, the Gospels or, or the stories of the Gospels, contain many marvels, peculiarly, ar that's a hard word to say, peculiarly <laughs> artistic, beautiful. Is it, a, is it a peculiarly difficult word to say? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, man. And then uh, <clears throat> he, the, the last time he, he says it is, it is not difficult to imagine the peculiar excitement and joy that one would feel if any specially beautiful fairy story were found to be primarily true. It's narrative to be history without thereby necessarily losing the mythical or allegorical significance that it has possessed. So he uses that word peculiar mm -hmm. a lot in to try and describe that feeling. And I think if I had to put my finger on it, it's that the peculiarity of um, fairy story is that it is a world. And you, and you, you kind of said about this too, Dan, is that, and, and Michael too, of course, but Dan more recently, it's a world that is not shackled by the, um, rules that we've made for ourselves in this world that we, we, that remind us of where we are and how we're stuck here. Right. And how yeah. um, death is here around us and how pain is here around us. It is a peculiar world because we're experiencing things that we wouldn't be able to experience if we were constantly reminded of what it is of this world. There are the glimpses, right? Those, um, the, the, the glimpses of truth with a capital T that come through and they come through brighter and stronger in a world that, that hasn't been, even like going back to like Paralandra hasn't been ruined uh, by the disaster of the world around us. I don't know. Maybe there's, is that, does that make sense? Is it the peculiar, well, he also, the peculiar thing, right? That you don't get that. Like, and if I were to go back, sorry, to go back last week where we talked about music and things like that, that is harder to do with music. So maybe I'm changing my tune on that <laughs> a little bit too. Uh, but yeah. Very that, good. That, very that, good. The, the father in me approves. <laughs> yeah. he, he also calls there. it uh he also calls it the fleeting glimpse of joy joy mm. beyond the walls of the world poignant as grief right so he's he even says it's beyond the walls of the world so can right. you get like a fleeting glimpse of joy from a painting from a piece of music from a mystery like can you think, can I you get so. that as a peculiarity, peculiarity? I've, I've had that experience as a, a I've, i love tolkien mm -hmm. and i get that experience from tolkien and I tell you that I get a similar experience from certain pieces of music, and I get a certain that a similarity of experience, not exactly the same, but a similarity of experience from certain pieces of art, of high art. When you, the kind of art that you can sit and look at for hours and ha, and be able to think and and notice de different details continuously, um, it it's art that draws your mind into a different place, 
and and it has at the edges of it a kind of joy. In the end, I find uh, fairy stories superior to that to to art in that regard. Um, uh, music is somewhat other of an experience, so I don't. But it does share that that hinting, that glimpse of joy. So to to finish this off, this lets this carries us right to our last section of the book, which is the epilogue. And in the epilogue, here's a sentence that probably is close to his central theme. He says here, in the eucatastrophe, we see a brief vision that the answer, the answer to the question, is it true, that we ask, that the answer may be greater. It may be a far off gleam or an echo of evangelium in the real world. The use of this word gives a hint of my epilogue. It is a serious and dangerous matter. And he goes down and says, um, I would venture to say that approaching the Christian story, that's capital C, capital S, from this direction, it has long been my feeling, a joyous feeling. The God redeemed the corrupt making creatures, we are, we are making creatures, men, in a way fitting to this aspect as to others of their strange nature. The Gospels contains a fairy story or a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. And then he goes on to talk more about the Gospels. But basically, that that more importantly, and, I, and I, this is really interesting, when you ask the question of fairy stories, is it true? His first answer would be no. No, it's not about truth in this regard. But if you do it really well, then yes, it can be about the glimpse, that final glimpse of real truth with a capital T, real joy with a capital J that core truth and joy, which is found in its truest form in the gospels, but, but is, but is, is in fairy stories and glimpses. He speaks to this directly in that same letter that he wrote to Christopher Tolkien hmm. um, again. And uh, so let me read that. He says, of course, I do not mean that the gospels tell what is only a fairy story, but I do mean very strongly that they do tell a fairy story, the greatest Man, the storyteller, would have to be redeemed in a manner consonant with his nature by a moving story. But since the author, if it is the supreme artist, with a capital A, and the author of reality, this one was also made to be, with a capital B, to be true on the primary plane. So that in the primary miracle, the resurrection, and the lesser Christian miracles too, though less, you have not only that sudden glimpse of the truth behind the apparent Ananke of our world, which I think means inevitability of our world. Uh, and I, don't I don't know the I don't know the meaning of that. Yeah, um, but a glimpse that is actually a ray of light through the very chinks of the universe about us. Um, and it's that those like the glimpse, those 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 rays of light that um, of of what you know what he would say is the greatest fairy story. That's 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 what these these smaller fairy stories, essentially the truth is what, the, that's what they hint at. That's what you catastrophe hints at is the greatest you catastrophe in uh, that's possible in this world. I, I love the way that he finishes this essay because, you know, of, of the modern time in which we live, everyone's trying to separate the art from the artist and make Lord of the Rings, whatever they want it to mean, make, make middle earth, whatever they want it to mean. And right here in this essay, Tolkien is basically connecting what he's doing as a sub creator in making his, his uh, fairy story, he's connecting it to the higher purpose of I am a sub creator making this story because it points to a higher reality that, that my, my you catastrophe and my tale is a smaller glimpse. It's a glimpse at what the true you catastrophe is. Um, I, I, he writes in this essay, he says the birth of Christ is the you catastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. He says the art of the tale has the supremely convincing tone of primary art, that is, of creation. It, uh, to reject it leads either to sadness or to wrath. And so I, I, it's, it's really interesting to me, just that, that connection. He's connecting what he's doing to the greater tale. And there's so many people nowadays that want Lord of the Rings to just mean whatever they want it to mean to, to, to them, you know, and he's, he's connecting it. He's like, no, this is, this is tied to the gospel. Right. And this, and by contrast, 
<laughs> oh no! <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's our favorite article. <laughs> Just to make the end point is there's an article that was written a year and a half ago that wrote, "No, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings isn't Christian." And then he goes into that, and he even says, "No, it's even it's even queer and very sexual." Right? This, his whole point is that it's. Right. Um, he his whole point is that he hasn't studied Tolkien at all. It's just in completely writing out of his own mind without any actual knowledge of who the author was. And I mean, maybe out of his mind, maybe out of another. <laughs> Got it. So, yeah, I I thank you for bringing that up. As by contrast, Jonathan, um, but I do think I think you're right, Dan. I think that Tolkien sees his work you know, um, whenever. A fairy story is written well as just giving, being able to give that glimpse, a brief glimpse of something uh, along the same lines that this kinds of stories that God tells. Um, yeah. It's it's curious to me because it's it's not curious. It's it's wonderful to me because Tolkien is to me walking that balance between humility and um, also using the gifts that he's been given. So so he is a sub creator and so he sub creates and he defends his sub creation in an essay that's like 90 pages long, but he, um, he also never assumes that his sub creation is going to is higher than it is and nothing more. And is anything more than a glimpse of the kind of mm-hmm. art that God does primary art. Um, and it makes me think, you know, of all the losses that we've had in the world of fantasy, to my mind, there are um, easily top five, fantasy writers in the last half century to century that was George R.R. R. Martin. But his entire art was is is um, bent towards a darkness and a nihilism, which is the opposite of the story that God tells. It is there is no redemption. There is nothing. He had tremendous, he has tremendous talent, this man. George R.R. R. Martin has unbelievable talent writes on incredible characters, has a very fertile mind in terms of his imagination and everything. And but all his story does is drag you into darkness and into the nihilism. Um, once you get pa- past the glimpses and the momentary um, fleeting joys of his story, it's all about uh, the hopelessness of that worldview, and which is, I would say, the opposite of Tolkien's worldview. Didn't he, isn't he the one that said uh, he wanted to like argue with Tolkien and say well, like Aragorn, like so he ruled. But what was his tax policy? Yeah, I mean that's that's the line that people grab because it's so silly. Um, but his deeper question, his deeper point was that <laughs> here's what here's the funny thing. His deeper point is all the all the um, normal details that we're all. I mean, look, open up your your phone. I mean, don't. But <laughs> if you were to open up your phone right now, you would find and look at the news. What is it all about? All the politics, all the economics, all the you yeah. know back and forth and people squabbling. That's what George R. R. Martin writes his fantasy story about. Is about those squabbles, and he's and he's yeah. and he's mistaking those things, those aspects of reality, and they are aspects of reality. He's mistaking those for the thing that's really important. Um, Tolkien yeah. would say, "Oh, I have the detail. You 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 criticize me for not having a tax policy. How about this? Where are the underpinnings of your world? How did it come about?" What, where's the core of your history? Because I got those details in spades and you got nothing. You just make crap up as you go along and invent words as you, you can't even invent the languages. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I didn't focus on the politics or the tax policy, the economics or the, the squabbling side. Um, that wasn't what was important to my story. And my story will last a lot longer than yours, which I would put <laughs> I mean, Tolkien. I thought you were going to say... Uh... I thought you were going to say, where's the ending of your book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. That's, that's the best one. Good job, Dan. No. <laughs> At least I have a you catastrophe. What do you have? <laughs> you don't even have a yeah. catastrophe. <laughs> you got nothing. That was pretty catastrophic at the end of the TV show from what I hear. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny the, the, those things about tax policy and uh, like what is it? Um, I just found the article here. Can orcs intermarry? Was there orc rehabilitation going on? Uh, was there orc genocide? Uh, uh, anyway, all these dumb things. What happened? What what happens if there was famine? What did what did he do? I'm like all these things are like things that drag us back into our reality and cover over yeah. those glimpses of truth. Because who cares about tax policy? The tax policy isn't true with a capital T. It's it's. It's just 
self-important people writing minor laws. And that's not anything that's great um, right. when it comes to glimpsing right. there's nothing. There's nothing deep about that. There's, yeah. there's something, I mean, it has to be done. You have to have a tax policy. You have to have, you know, politics in order to live in the real world, in the primary world. But I think Tolkien would be pretty firmly on the side that that's a, that's a lesser side of the primary reality. That's not, that's not the side that has all the great, the things that you actually want to glimpse. Nobody's like, man, let me pick up a good story about tax policy. Let me find a good novel about, you know, some, some you know, internal squabbling between, I mean, some people do, I guess, you know, they, they, they like the, some, somebody's feeding all the daytime soaps back when I was a kid and, and all the yeah. reality TV shows of today. But uh, it's a, definitely a, a, a lower and meaner in the old term version of the word mean, meaner desire. It isn't the higher thing. Yeah. And I think that goes back to our discussion earlier about different types of fantasy and how that's not a fairy tale. A fairy tale, you have to escape all that. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, right. you have to have glimpses outside the walls of the world. And some people, right. they don't believe there's anything outside this world. So for them, they just want to focus on politics, they want to focus on social justice causes or, or whatnot, because to them, that that is the highest thing you can aspire to is is you know your, yep. your devils and your demons are here on earth and you have to fight them. Yeah, but that's a that's a I, poverty uh, of that's a poverty of vision. That's a poverty of right. a paucity of imagination. That's just a lack right there. That isn't correct. That's that's not something better. Correct. Yeah. Anyway, of yeah. course we'd say that we're on the exploring Tolkien podcast, but uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so well, so I here, tried. I tried. Let me, yeah, man, it's, we're we're approaching an hour. I'm gonna try. This is this is. I'm gonna try and sum up on fairy oh. stories in one sentence. All right, go for it. Um, and I, I'm probably gonna have to like work my way through this. So give me a second here. Uh -huh. Um, so so I I come away from this, and the idea I get about why fairy stories. Why did he write this essay? Because. Because fairy stories or fantasy, let's just call it fantasy because people get put off by the word fairy stories. Our, our views are way down on this just because fairy stories, like are we, is like fairy the word there? Anyway, because uh, <clears throat> fairy stories are, they're uniquely, they're a unique artistic exercise where the author speaks directly to the reader's imagination that then essentially they together are truly subcreating a world that is uh, that is experienced wholly, not just partially, wholly, meaning all all the, like geographically, uh, artistically, musically, like the things that are written in there, they're they're experienced wholly by the reader and the author. And it is only through that holistic experience that actual truth can be glimpsed. Truth with a capital T. Truth with um, um, you know the, the, the truth with by. Truth based upon the eucatastrophe of this world of, of the resurrection, right? Those those massive glimpses of truth where joy and sorrow are mingled together, and they, they the, the the tears of joy and sorrow are, are so hard and deep that they. Uh, this is not one sentence anymore, guys. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so the idea that fairy stories a unique artistic exercise where the author speaks directly into the imagination of the re the reader to subcreate a holistic new world wherein glimpses of Eternal truth can be felt more acutely than in any other uh, earthbound realm. I don't know. Does that sound good? Yes, I would yes. add the word magical in magical. front of the in front of your world. So the, yeah. the that the 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 writer speaks this secondary world into the mind of the reader, but it's a sec, it's a magical world. You have mm -hmm. to have that yeah, element yes, of enchantment. Right, right. Um, right. It, in it thus the word uh, fantasy or fairy uh, correct in front of it yes correct uh, that was pretty good jonathan well done thanks I, you almost got it <laughs> <laughs> a minus <laughs> <laughs> oh man we spent six weeks on this and a minus great guys thanks <laughs> well it was it was it's good it's good it's... we gave it the old college try <laughs> <laughs> so uh we're gonna get into our members podcast guys but if if you've stuck with us the whole way, hey, uh, go into your podcast app of choice and leave us a review. We'd love that. That'd be great. Appreciate that. Uh, and of course, as usual, guys, you can become a member if you want to get us. Uh, uh, you know, if you if you don't want to descend into the madness of a week earlier without us, 
you know, because I know you want to hear our voices for another 20 minutes. Uh, become a member. Go to thewonder.com slash member and you can listen to us talk about what other stories are you catastrophic? Can we find a modern you catastrophic story that is on par with what Tolkien would define as a true fairy story subcreation? Also, should we stop looking at Lord of the Rings art? That's right. Yes. What we said with Harrison. Like, are we going, are we going, does Lord of the Rings art ruin Lord of the Rings for us? And should we just abandon, should we become like the, the Amish in Middle Earth? No, wait, the, Am <laughs> the Amish readers. I don't, I don't know what to call that. I'm trying to, yeah. The, the Men, Luddites. Yeah. Luddites, Mennonites. Anyway. All right, guys, we're going to jump into our extended podcast and uh, I hope you join us there. Good. See you later. Yep. All right. Good. Goodbye. Freeloaders.